plastering and dry lining tutor and today we're going to do a wee bit of internal plastering. So we have set our board up, uh, prepared the wall with water to prevent any suction and now we're going to coat out the wall, straighten it and devil flood it. flatten it out and give it a wee smoothing over to see if any slacks or hollow areas when we straighten it out. Okay, we're now going to straighten the wall. This is straight edge timber, making sure there's no warps. Bends in the timber. I'm going to work off our two profiles. I'm going to weave straight up, keeping any excess water. Go side to side, for it makes it easier than when floating. As you can see in the monitor here, the hollow spot here, which then has to be Fill that. I'm going to give it a nice wee lick, nothing too heavy. Okay, take off the next Float the wall to allow them to be skimmed at a later stage. So, what you want to be doing is just in circular motions, closing the pores of the cement, allowing, allowing the lines then for the, the skim to catch the lines. That's what we put the lines in the, the water for to catch the skim. So, just in a circular motion, closing it all over. Hi guys, back again here. So, we're going to talk about, talk about some basic tools to be used in plastering. First of all, we have the trowel for applying the mortar with. And we have the hook for holding the mortar on top of. We then have a float for closing over the mortar and devil floating. Level. Gauging trowel for cleaning out buckets and getting into them hard spots we can't be got. And the trusty old hammer. Okay guys, we are now going to talk about the simple mix in which we apply to the wall before plastering. It is a mix of 4 to 1, 4 sand, 1 lime, and a, maybe a cup full of mortar mix. We then let it mix in the mixer, we keep enhancing the mix then, keep going over the mix, put more sand in, more lime, until the mix becomes full. Keep it nice and workable, the mortar mix keeps it nice and workable, you can get it on the hook, half it, and spread it.
All right, guys, I'm Jason from Crab Channel, the joiner shooter. Uh, so today I'm going to show you how to fit a sample door hinge. Uh, this is a three inch butt hinge. I'm just going to chill it on the timber. All right, so we're going to set your hinge in the position. This is normally six inches down, nine inches up, and flush to the front edge. And a simple pencil line around it. You set your depth in, hold it flush, and mark underneath. And transfer your line across. Grab yourself a chisel, mark along the edges first, top and bottom, then up the side. Then we use a technique called feather, where you're weakening the timber. Set the tails up flat, clean it out, then you just clean it down the end of your depth. Make sure your, your corners and your edges are all clean. Test fit your hinge and it should be neat on all four sides and flush. And just need to screw it into place. And that's it, ready to hang the door. My name is Aidan and I'm the Bricklayer Shooter here at Craft. Um, so we're going to line out a two brick pillar. Alright, so the area has been loaded out. Uh, mortar has been mixed using a mix ratio of 4 to 1. So we're going to get the first course. Um, all course up to 75mm, rising 75mm each time. So, two parts of the bottom, you have a bed and a joint. What I'm doing here now is just putting on the perp joint. Um, bed is the mortar that's laid directly beneath the brick. So, lay it at your first corner and check for square. So, Using the builder square, you just set her up with a run of your level and checking if your corner is a perfect 90 degree square. Remember to check for level as well.
folks. Um, we're going to look at the basic tools now needed um, to carry out the wee demonstration, okay? So, first off, we have a trowel, a building trowel, all right? Come in various sizes, 1910, 1911, um, but very, very, um, one of the, the, the main tools that you need. Secondly, we'll have our level. Again, come in a variety of sizes. Um, 1200 is normally a good size for um, any kind of cavity work or, or doing what we're doing here. Um, we will need a uh, tip as well. Uh, club hammer, bolster, and uh, a joint nail. Okay, just used for finishing the joints and closing them up. Folks, uh, we're going to look at now the max uh, or the max ratio for the mortar that we're going to use for both the plastering tasks and the uh, bricklaying tasks. Um, within the workshop environment, we use um, a lime mortar uh, for the simple fact that it doesn't go hard. Um, it can be reused um, a few times over, so that's the reason why we're, we're using the, the lime mix. So um, there's a few components you'll need for to mix the mortar. Um, firstly, you need a sand. Okay, comes in, lorry loads, come bags, whatever, um, but um, that's the first component. Second component we're going to be using is lime, hydrated lime, um, and the third is mortar mix, or fab, or uh, another name for it is um, plasticizer. Okay, it's just used to aerate the mortar and add bubbles through the mix so it makes the uh, mortar more workable. So, your mixer um, set up in the stand, make sure it's secure and level ground. Before you start, um, you're adding water. Okay, so just add about half a bucket of water. Uh, take your mortar mix, and you're adding in about two capfuls, two or three capfuls. Hi right, guys, this is Ham Jason from Craft Chilling and the Curtain and Journey Tutor. Uh, today we're just going to run through making a simple half lap jack and using some basic hand tools from your carpenter's mallet, chisels, tenon saw, marking gauge, and square. So on the joint we're going to use a sample of 2x2 white wood. Uh, first of all, just square the line, square line and use your other piece of timber and mark your what. Square your two lines right around it. And then set your mortise gauge with a single pan end to the center point. Same process again, and all these and two the exact same. Mark out your waist. Now I've got a top half in one piece and the bottom half in the other. Same American out in both pieces, no difference. Okay, you're sitting here, two bucks, marked out. Set the piece in on your denture and take the cannon saw, cutting the waist side of the line on both sides.
Air good and flat. And it's just the same process again here for water piece. Hi, my name is Toby Walters. I work for Craft Trainer. Today I'm going to be a quick demo on how to sharpen a chisel. Now, a few of the basic tools we need, of course, are a sharpening stone or a royal stone. We need some oil and a cloth. Now, I have a 25 mil chisel here. The chisel is made up of two edges. You have a flat edge at the back, and on the front edge you have a bell. Now, we're going to start with the back of the chisel first. Use a bit of oil and the oil stone. Now, applying quite firm pressure, we'll give the back of the chisel a rub on the stone. Now, immediately, you will see that the oil stone has polished the back of the chisel. Now when you're happy enough with the back, we'll turn the chisel around to the front of the bevel edge, which should be about 30 degrees. So we place the chisel on the stone, we lift it up till we get to 30 degrees, maintaining that all the way through. Now I use the stone from back to front, moving it from side to side. Some people would use a figure eight. But all this does is that it spreads the surface of your stone and you're not wearing any one particular side of the stone away. Okay, now we've done that, we'll give it a wee wipe. Now the bevel at the front has been sharpened and this leaves what we call a wire edge at the back or some people call it a burr. Now, to get rid of that wee burr, again, we place the back of the chisel down in the oil stone. Not so much pressure this time, just enough to take the burr of the back of the chisel. We'll give another wee wipe. And there we 
الحرج ان الشعب شر Hello, this is Toby from Craft Trainer. Today we're going to have a look at the standard 13 amp plug dock. When on site or in the workshop, accidents happen and things get damaged, leaving them unsafe and dangerous to use. And plug tops are no exception. Here are a few different examples of the damage can be caused. The first one, the pins are bent, therefore it won't fit into the socket. This next one, the wires have been pulled and they've been exposed. Plug top needs to come off and needs rewired. This one, the worst case scenario, the plug top has been completely broken into pieces. It needs replaced. Now, if you go to our website at Craft Training VLE, I'll demonstrate how to change a plug. See you there. Hello, this is Toby from Craft Training. Following on from the other video, I'll show you how to change a standard 13 amp plug top. This plug top has been damaged. The pins are bent. This one's actually broken off. So for demonstration purposes, I've already dismantled this plug, opened the cable grip screws, opened the centre screw to separate the plug. I've loosened all the terminals, took the cable grip off, and I've removed the wires. Now there's three wires that go back under the plug. And we'll give the copper a nice wee twist again, makes them a bit easier to go on to the new terminals. Now we'll take our new plug, we loosen the centre screw, we loosen one screw completely on our cable grip, put it to one side. Now, we we'll set our green and white, which is there, to the top, and we'll tighten that up. We we'll set our neutral, which is the blue, to the left, and we'll set the wire nicely into the terminal, and we'll tighten that one up. Now, our live wire goes to the fuse side. And that will go up in here. Make sure it fits nice securely in. And don't over tighten it. You should be just tightened that they don't pull out of the terminal. Make sure all the wires are down below the plug to let the cap on nice and flat. Get your cable grip and put your screw back in through. We'll tighten the cable grip. Okay, make sure that you have the right fuse in the plug you're replacing for the plans that you're using. Put the plug top back on again. Make sure it sits nice and flat all the way around. Like so. Tighten your centre screw and there's your plug. Now for a more detailed version Hello this is Toby from Craft Trainer. Following on from the other video I'll show you how to change the standard 13 amp plug top. This plug top has been damaged, the pins are bent this one's actually broken off. So for demonstration purposes, I've already dismantled this plug, opened the cable grip screws, opened the centre screw to separate the plug. I've loosened all the terminals, took the cable grip off, and I've removed the wires. Now there's three wires that go back under the plug. We'll give the copper a nice wee twist again, makes them a bit easier to go on to the new terminals. Now we'll take our new plug, 
We listen to Santa Street. We listen to one screw completely on our cable grip. Put it to one side. Now, we'll set our green and white, which is there, to the top. And we'll tighten that up. We'll set our neutral, which is the blue, to the left. And we'll set the wire nicely into the terminal. And we'll tighten that one up. Now, our live wire goes to the fuse side. And that will go up in here. Make sure it fits nice securely in. Okay guys, we here from Craft and today I'm going to show you a bit of painting onto a panel door. First things first, we're going to dust the door down. This door has previously been filled and sanded. So we're going to give it a light wee dusting down to make any, uh, sure any dust is free from dust because the paint won't take to the dust. We light dusting down. Okay, and we're going to apply paint. Today I'm using a blue paint emulsion. We want to be using a sort of decent brush. Uh, here I went today with a three inch purdy brush, which is one of the best on the market. Really good for fanning to the joints and get a nice even cup. So I'm going to go ahead and put a wee bit on here. I'm going to show you how to spread. Evenly, nice even strokes. Okay, so you make sure that you have a good bit on the paint brush. Okay, so we'll kill out the bulk of the, the door first. Nice even strokes, never go too far, about maybe a foot in length. Another dip. Now, these brushes are really good for frowning into the edges, as you can see. And just push the edges of my brush in and she'll fan out into the edge there, giving me a nice, clean, even cup all the way down. And I'm gonna fan out any excess paint. Same at the top. Okay. Always making sure that you've plenty of paint on the brush. Bring this on down now, kill out the bulk. Once again, I'm coming down about a foot, just to make sure that I'm not going over a bit of door, this, this, I'm not running out of paint. Again, I'm gonna fan out to the edges here. Fanning my brush way out into the edges and coming down for a nice even cut. Okay, I'm gonna fan off any excess. Repeat this all the way over the door, all the way around. Now, to get into any indents, cracks or crevices, you want to be putting a nicely dab on the paint brush and then giving it a good push into the, the seam. Guys, for any more information, details, or tips on painting, if you want to visit our website or our Facebook page. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Toby Rollers from Craft Training. Today we're going to be talking about a marking gauge. Now marking gauge is used in woodworking to describe lines parallel to a reference edge. It is made of hardwood with a number of different parts. It's got an 8 to 12 inch beam, a fence, and lavy brass for wear and tear, and a tightening screw. Now the fence slides up and down the beam to give you different measurements. Now you notice on one side of the beam we have a single fixed pin 
per mark on your woodworking joints. And on the other side of the beam, we have a single fixed pin with an adjustable one. This is for your mortise joints. Now this particular gauge is a combination of a marking gauge and a mortise gauge. We'll cover the uses of these in the next video. Hi, my name is Toby Walters from Craft Trainer. Continuing on with the marking gauge, we're going to use a single fixed pin on this side. Now, we're going to mark this timber halfway across. So we'll set our marking gauge on with the shoulder against the face side. Now, we'll use the pin and we'll pierce a hole. Now, if we turn the timber around the other way and the hole fits directly with the pin again, then you can be sure your measurement is accurate. Now, we scrape our line all the way around the timber, then we'll highlight our line. Now, if I was to blow that up, it would look something like this. You have your saw cut right down the middle, taking half your line off, and the other side line will remain for accuracy. Now, if we go to our mortise side, this is the double side of the pin. Now again, we're going to split this trimmer into three. Now, we'll tighten up our fence and we will scribe our line and we'll highlight the two lines. And mark our waist. Now, if I was to blow that up, you'll see the way that the chisel will fit nicely into the grooves. Again, you're losing half your line and the other half remaining. Now, they say if you want a good joint, use a pencil. If you want a great joint, use a marking gauge.